Welcome uh, to Parev TV. Joining us is uh, Dr. Taner Akcam, historian sociologist, and one of the first Turkish academics to acknowledge and openly discuss the Armenian genocide. And he is, as we all know, recognized as a leading international authority on the subject. Dr. Akcam, uh, I really would like to thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, talking to you. We are trying to understand the Armenian Azeri war that has been going on for over a month now. Uh, many believe that without the provocation of Turkey, this war would not have started, nor dragged on for as long as it is. Can you help us understand uh, Turkish mentality vis-a-vis -vis Armenia and the region, and what does Turkey want? Uh, it's very obvious it's a part of a Turkish Turkey's foreign policy and also I think it's not a wrong assessment to claim or to believe that it is actually Turkey's war but not Azerbaijan's. Uh, Turkey, especially after the failed coup d'etat 2016, started a very aggressive foreign policy, uh, not only towards Armenia and Azerbaijan, I mean nagorno Karabakh, but also towards Syria, and Turkey has also a very aggressive policy in Eastern Mediterranean. It seems that uh, we have a very old German saying uh, regarding the German Empire 19th century, that Germany as a latecomer wanted a more space under the sun. So uh, this means German Empire as a late imperialist power wanted to have more power and influence in international politics. It seems that Tayyip Erdogan wants to have more influence and more power in Middle East and more than maybe the Middle East wants to be the representative of Muslim suppressed people in the world. This is his foreign policy. And uh, there are some domestic reasons for this aggressive foreign policy also. Turkey has major economic problems and P Turkey has major democratic problems related to democracy and human rights. And it's a very general rule. If a dictator has certain problem in uh, inland, in the domestic of country, they mostly follow a very radical foreign policy. In regard to Turkey, I have to add one more point. It is also, I think, very important to understand Tayyip Erdogan's psychology. It is the year 2023. It is the 100 years of the establishment of Turkish Republic. And Tayyip Erdogan firmly believes that he is founding a new republic. And he considered himself in a very strong competition with Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, he believes, founded the first Turkish Republic, but on the wrong piles, on the wrong souls. And Tayyip believes, Tayyip Erdogan, he is establishing a second Republic, but this time on correct uh, ground. And then he tries to prove that he's going to establish something better than Mustafa Kemal. And what it could be, and it is a new Lausanne, a new uh, agreement that Turkey will win new territories. So the Tayyip Erdogan's foreign policy is a revision of Lausanne Agreement in form of incorporating new territories to Turkey. And in Syria, they already almost successfully managed this. They are controlling certain territories in Syria. This is not exactly what he wanted, but under the given condition, this is what he could manage. And he is now claiming the same thing in 
Eastern Mediterranean generally, maybe in form of a, a sphere of influence fight with Greece, Israel, and uh, Egypt in form of uh, controlling the natural resources. And towards East, they also made it very clear, it has nothing to do with uh, personally with Tayyip Erdogan, Already the old general staff, Ilkar Bashbu, and the new defense minister uh, publicly declared that they are aiming a un united uh, federative state with Azerbaijan. If you put all these together, you can understand that Turkey is following in a very aggressive policy. Maybe one last reminder to the listeners uh, Azerbaijan launched the uh, campaign against uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, September 27, 2020, and it was exactly 100 years ago. September 28, 2020, Kazım Karabekir launched its offensive against Armenia. I don't think that the dates are a coincidence. This is my overall macro perception of what's going on on the field. You know, you have been definitely, uh, you have dedicated your life to the study of genocide and the history of the region. But when you hear of Turkey has a policy of restoration of the Ottoman Empire, what do you make out of this fascination of Erdogan to become a sultan? and extend the Turkish Empire. We are in the year 2020, not 1915, and not when the Treaty of Lausanne was signed. I don't think that they have a dream of restoration of Ottoman Empire. Uh, my sense of understanding is that after the collapse of Soviet Union, and after the collapse of the Cold War, end of Cold War, and American-Russian uh, tension in the area, it emerged a vacuum in the Middle East. And who is going to fill this new vacuum in the Middle East? And my understanding is Tayyip Erdogan wants to expand the power of Turkey mainly in the Middle East in form of controlling new energy resources in form of his approach to Azerbaijan. And we have the similar policies of Erdogan towards Kurds. I don't think that it is a coincidence that Tayyip Erdogan and Mesut Barzani, the uh, Northern Iraq Kurdish autonomous regime working closely together. These are all regional expansionist policies of Turkey. And I have a map in my vision. I mean, not in my vision. There is a map, actually. Uh, I don't know whether you have seen this. Uh, I personally published this map a couple of times. This is a map published by Turkish parliament 1924, after even Lausanne, signing of Lausanne Agreement. This map includes an important portion of Syria, an important portion of northern Iraq, today's the Kurdish areas. I think uh, territorial expansion might be a part of this plan but the main goal, my understanding, is the controlling of the energy resources towards Azerbaijan and towards northern Iraq and possible in Syria. And one central goal of Turkish government within that larger plan is to prevent any autonomous or independent uh, Kurdish entity in the Middle East. You know, uh, many, uh, not many years ago, but you have uh, been uh, uh, quoted as saying uh, that not recognizing the Armenian genocide 
for Turkey is like a cancer that is growing within Turkey and it will be its demise. Is this where the hatred is coming from? The cancer within Turkey growing? It is really very scary development and you are right, not recognizing and historic injustices can serve as ground for new injustices. Turkey's, and it is in that sense understandable that Armenian people in Armenia and Karabakh consider these Turkey's new attempt of expansionism in the region within the paradigm of history that they consider this, even though let's assume that Turkey does not have these genocidal plans, uh, it's not so easy uh, within this international constellation, but Armenian people has all the right to consider, to perceive these Turkish policies towards area towards uh, Armenia within the perspective of old genocide because Turkey hasn't recognized the Armenian genocide yet. And you have to also consider this within the policy of Turkish government towards Azerbaijan. They are culturally and ideologically propagating unification of Turkish people with Azeri people. So they believe, the existing ruling elite believes that Turkish people today, Turkey today, has more common than, uh, more common with Azerbaijani people than the Turkish citizen in Turkey today, which means Kurds, Assyrians, Armenians, and the Greeks. So this means a policy of unification against their own subject citizens, Kurds, Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks. I think this is a very dangerous development. You consider your own Armenian citizen, your own Kurdish citizen, your own Assyrian and Greek citizen as enemy aliens, but then Azeri people as your united one unified cultural uh, part. And I think it's a very dangerous uh, modern state policy and I think the Kurds and uh, Armenians in Turkey today has all the reason to be scared because this policy excludes a certain element of Turkish citizen within the uh, citizenry, within the concept of citizenship in Turkey and makes them enemy, this is like uh, Trump's policy of hatred here in United States against a certain segments of the policy, uh, certain segments of the United States uh, citizens. I don't think that, uh, I mean, bottom line, let me summarize with a sentence. It's a very dangerous policy for a certain segments of Turkish citizens in Turkey, yes. You know, when we look into study the history of uh, Harapal over the centuries, empires came, empires went, and uh, we fast forward it to the period where Stalin gave it to the Azeris, and at one point the Azeris accepted uh, that, Azer that Harapal would be joined to Armenia. But as we stand it today, there is a question of, uh, throughout the world, not only in that region, of self-determination as opposed to territorial integrity. I'm sure we all have heard of these things. My question is, has the international community able to face these difficult problems that exist throughout different countries in the world, especially 
in the Soviet Union where there were hundred similar groups that may cause similar problems in the future. Are we ready to address these issues? And who owns who be, who owns Garapa? Who where does Garapa belong to? Armenia or Azeri? Uh, it is unfortunate that we have today two conflicting international rules, international mm -hmm. principles. One international principle is self-determination of nations. Nagorno-Karabakh, as everybody knows, a historic Armenian land and occupied by Armenians over centuries. And Armenian people has all the right to claim self-determination over the territories that they are living. On the other side also, we have the principle of sovereignty, principle of territorial integrity of nation states, and how these two principles can live together is a very complicated problem and you have to find a compromise if these two principles really at odd with each other, conflicts with each other. Armenian Azeri conflict today as a simple example of it. And here the central question is whether or not maximalist demands of the parties in Azerbaijan Armenian conflict can solve this problem. We don't have, I don't believe that the moral rules and principle can solve that problem. Either you solve this problem on the ground mm -hmm. with a war, or you will find a compromise. You will learn to compromise. For Azerbaijan, the maximalist demand is the territory. And this is a very dangerous demand in the sense, so I'm not, arguing that Azerbaijan do not have an international legal claim, territorial integrity, but Azerbaijan understands today implementation of this plan in a way that they don't care about the people living on that territory. Mm -hmm. So their policy is that to take back this territory regardless whether people would live on that territory or not. Mm. So this policy includes an ethnic cleansing. This policy includes a, even genocidal perspective also. This is Azeri territory and we will take this territory back whatever the price is. This is the maximalist Azeri demands and they are working for it. And the Armenian maximalist demand is nagorno karabakh is Armenian territory and it will be independent and whatever the price is, we will keep this independence. And I think in that case, this maximalist demand cannot be real, realistic demand from an Armenian perspective also. Because Armenian cannot find international support. Mm -hmm for an independent Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm not an expert of international diplomacy. My only recommendation or humble suggestion is Armenians also should think about what are the demands or solutions which are not only maximalists that a unification of Berk Karabakh and Armenia cannot be a final solution at this very moment because of very simple reason. It has nothing to do with morality. It's, it has something to do with money, population, and armed struggle. Armenian is a three million people, and whether or not they can really manage against 80 million Turkey and 10 million Azeris with a lot of money and weapons. You These know, are the policy of realism. 
you know, I'm, I think Armenians and the whole world, including you and me, are surprised that Armenia withstood the war for over a month now. They're fighting Turkey and Azerbaijan, and over a month, we seem to be holding our ground. Our troops are, have a better morale. We don't have mercenaries, jihadists imported from other parts of the world. And maybe, maybe if it drags on, Armenia will win this war. Maybe we'll all be surprised. Maybe the solution will come on the ground. Dr. Taner Akjim, I really am honored to talk to you. My last question is, you've been hearing many reports, many interviews, many analysis. Is there something we are missing in looking or focusing on? Is there something we have not focused on from you as a historian, sociologist, somebody who's dedicated his life to this whole region. Is there something we are not looking into or not questioning which we should pay more attention to? Uh, to my understanding, I'm not an expert of the um, uh, current development in the area, but I think I followed several debates and discussions. Yes. People are aware of mag magnitudes of the problems. There are so many different layers. One important aspect I would emphasize is that it is also a fight between a democratic regime and authoritarian regimes in the area. Mm -hmm. This hasn't been emphasized maybe enough. Armenia, despite all its difficulties, established a democratic regime and in this fight, my fear is this could be some negative result for democracy in Armenia too. Mm -hmm. One other fear is that I have, uh, as historians, we always love to develop historical parallels. Kazem Karabekir's offensive in 1920 created a result of end of independence of Armenia and Sovietization of the area. And if war continues in the form that it is now, it might also end up with more Russian control in the area. Russification of the area seems to be one of the realistic outcome of the war also. My only hope is this is what we have all really fight for. Peace without any precondition now and going to the negotiation table. We don't want a young boy, 19, 20 years old, whether it's Azeri boy or Armenian boy, they should not be really killed and destroyed on this battlefield. We, knew, we need these young people, especially Armenian young people, considering the number of Armenian population, and we should fight for the peace. This is my last message. Dr. Taner Akchim, it's been an honor and a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for sharing your views on the very sad situation out there. Thank you. Thank you so much.